The views expressed on the Warren and Bradley show are not necessarily those held by the hosts, Warren and Bradley, nor of the proprietors of the website, warrenandbradley.com. Four, three, two, one. Make some magic. Hello, and welcome to the Warren and Brad Show, or Bradley Show. <laughs> I think we <laughs> um, we've been trying to do this uh, a number of times. Try to get an intro going. This is the intro for the Warren and Bradley Show, a podcast featuring me, Bradley, and me, Warren. <laughs> this is our amazing theme music, which, after an exhaustive search, we have uh, narrowed down from a site with free. What was it? It was like. Free, like, license free, license free music. electronic shitty music. Yeah. Um, I'm the only one who can actually hear the theme song right now because I'm the only one with headphones on. So now I'm going to turn the theme song off. Oh, this is terrible. You <laughs> can't talk about turning the theme song off. It's still off. going in my headphones. It's really ridiculous. <laughs> okay, that's all right. It's the theme song off now. Uh, apparently. Okay, yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> it's... This is the intro. <laughs> I hope you enjoy. <laughs> For those of you who uh, don't know who Warren and Brad are, um, we're, this is so we're young roustabouts. Uh, I can't. I don't know why. You would think blind people maybe they get robbed a lot. Oh, but the person that robs the blind person, though. Well, they're robbing. They're I robbing. Mean, I, well, it's like there are some ethical uh, considerations with, like, a mugger. Maybe. Like, either. you know, I, I guess muggings happen here. But if you're like, let's say in New York City, people are getting mugged. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're a mugger and you see a blind person, do you really mug that blind person? I don't know. I would just think it's easy. Yeah, but I think that's yeah, pretty low at that point. Eh, well, but they're, I don't know. If, if you're like a crackhead trying to score your next hit, you know. Yeah, maybe, but man alive. I feel like it's one of those things that if you end up in the joint and they find out and they're like, you know. <laughs> so it's kind of like child molester. Oh, yeah, yeah. Rob from the blood. But they're like, they're you know, they're all, you're, you're sitting around with the guys and they're talking about what they're in for. And they're like, oh, yeah, I was mugging people. And they're like, oh, that's cool. And they get to the last guy and he's like, yeah, I was mugging people. And he's like, I mugged this, uh, blind woman mm-hmm. I feel like the other muggers like just beat the shit out of this guy <laughs> it's so because it's one thing to mug like I don't know I guess that you mug old ladies though too don't you yeah like you don't just always... mug able-bodied people well, I mean and this is all based on television like, stereotypes about mugging this, yeah. But, yeah there's always the old bag and then he's like ah, give me that and like runs off and yeah goes, help help he's taking my billfold I feel it's okay, well not okay, but I feel it's better to mug an old lady than it is to mug a blind person. Mm-hmm. If you had to put, yeah, if you had to put it on a scale, I would guess so. I think it's, it's mugging a blind person is like, is like mugging a child. Mm. It's like, if but there was... children don't usually have money. Well, they have like lunch money sometimes. sometimes. And sometimes nowadays these children have like cellular phones, phones. Yeah. yeah. And then if there was like an eight-year-old walking down the street going to school and you're like pushed him over and like took his money and his phone and stuff you know what I mean yeah. I feel like they'd beat you up in the joint for that too well there used to be this thing they'd call rolling drunks where people like in I don't know when this happened maybe like ages ago in the subway in New York olden times in olden times uh, when people would be like stumbling home from bars and they'd just like pass out in the sub- subway you yeah. just rifle through their pockets I feel like that's because they kind of put themselves in that yeah. situation you know well, the, the interesting thing about rolling the drunks is Shanghai. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like... So you're, you're on a boat to... <laughs> oh, my God, you're in San Francisco. Yeah. You're there for the weekend. You're doing a little drinking. Maybe you get slipped a Mickey. Maybe you just have too much to drink. You go to the whorehouse. You like, go to the whorehouse. Next thing you know, you're passed out. You wake up. You're on your way to Shanghai. You're on your way to Hong Kong. What did they do with them? They did, it was like white slavery or something? They make them work in salt mines or something? No, you just worked on the ship. Oh, okay. But what could you do? You couldn't go back. Yeah. So they're like, get to work. And if you're like, I don't want to work, they're like... They beat you. Well, yeah, what are you going to do? You got no choice. And you're like, all right. So you get there, and maybe you get to Shanghai, and by that time, you're probably like a sailor. 
You know what I mean? You've, if you're drinking well, in San Francisco, you're like, I don't know. That was the whole thing, too, with the press gangs in England, where if you were just, like, wandering around the shoreline, suddenly a big mob of people come with batons and beat you and carry you away into a ship. It's like, God damn it. You're walking home to your wife with a nice loaf of bread or something, and suddenly you're, like, in the middle of the Indian Ocean getting shattered by cannonballs. But I feel like that back then, your normal life wasn't so great anyways. Too, yeah. So well, like, eh. yeah, I guess if you're a sailor, at least you got meals every day. And yeah, like, you have some adventures, you have some meals. Some scurvy. I, I don't know, I feel like if I was, like, in England years ago, just on my little plot of land, and I had, like, a kind of a sick pig, <laughs> and I had, like, some, some like, kids, they were all, like, scurvy or whatever. 12 or 13 kids. Yeah, there's all these kids, and, like, I'm just hoeing away, like, growing things, and, like, I'm getting, like, raped and pillaged constantly. I'd be like... I'm gonna, do you want to take me on a boat? I'll go wherever you want to take well, me. You could also maybe potentially get prize money as well. Which uh, even every member of the crew would get a... If, if you captured an enemy ship, like the captain got... I can't remember how it all broke down. I think the captain got 50%. Well, they had to give some to the admiralty, and then the captain got a big cut off the gross, then the first officers, the lieutenants, like down the, down the chain of command, and then even the uh, average little sailor would get their... their yeah, it's fun. Yeah. You get you get some money. You don't have that much responsibility. Next thing you know, you're in some strange port of call, and you're like Getting making love to yeah a, a prostitute, an exotic prostitute. Okay, if you had lived hundreds of years ago, would you? And prostitution was just rampant, yeah, widespread. Would you go to prostitutes? Would you think like culturally, since you would you would been born in that culture, you had grown up with those morals, you would have no problem. Yeah, probably. I don't know where I would come up with the idea that it's it was bad. necessarily wrong if I had grown up in a society. It was like, the prostitutes live down there, you give them some money, you have a good time, and that's how things go. I, well, I think, I think in most cultures there was still some sort of moral guilt associated with it, but I don't think, nothing like it is now. I mean, I guess maybe in any Christian culture... Well, my thing with the prostitutes is always uh, the prostitutes that I actually see in real life are so horrendous. Yeah, it's uh, it's just awful, yeah. and you just you just like you just want to take them home and maybe like smother them with a pillow, or <laughs> just do something to put them out of their misery. But it's the idea of like so this is this is this is how it starts. Where it, suddenly, I know like ten years later, you're arrested with like, I'm the Green River Killer prostitutes in your closet, and I'm doing it for their own good. Um, no, <coughs> the idea of like paying all the prostitutes I've seen to have intercourse with me. It's like, they, there's no way they could pay me enough it might have intercourse with them. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering, like... Maybe that should be, like, a government program with prostitutes who aren't making enough money. They're ugly, they're disease-ridden, they're disgusting. They're... The hard economic times that we're having now, they're not able to attract customers, and maybe there should be some sort of program where we subsidize them, where we pay them to not have sex with people. It'd probably be good for society. Yeah. Stop the spread of disease. I do like the idea of, you know, maybe the high-class prostitute, the call girl. Oh, yeah. I could maybe see that. I mean, I, if it was many years ago and prostitution wasn't as stigmatized as it was now and there was a attractive prostitute down the street, you know, yeah. I probably would do that. Well, you know, in Japan, I mean, if my information is wrong, I apologize, but apparently there are these... <laughs> I mean, they have a whole different idea about, you know, prostitution and sex that's not at all as stigmatized as it is here. And there are places, like, they have all these health clubs, which basically just offer various sexual services. I think that actual vaginal penetration is illegal. Like, you're not allowed to pay for that. Hmm. But you can do anal. You hmm. can have blowjobs. Hmm. You can have, like, erotic massages where right. they basically, like... You know, they rub their naked body, oiled bodies all over you. Lovely. So, like, but it, there's also not uh, as much of a stigma against the sex trade workers. So, like, there's girls in high school who are like, oh, I want some extra money to buy my, you know, Louis Vuitton bag. And so they'll go and, like, go to the blowjob house for, you know, several weeks here and there. Oh there's these pamphlets that they distribute on these roads that are like these bright colored cartoony pamphlets where it has all the success stories of these girls who's like I made you know 80,000 yen in two days and it's like oh, and call this number and you can go it's very odd I wonder about the success stories 
Yeah, I mean... It sounds more like that, you know, the, the like, stripper that's in law school type the thing. Heart of yeah. I don't know if that's actually ever happening. Every stripper I've ever met has usually been very sad and drug-addled. Like, but maybe that's maybe impressive. that's just because here there is such a stigma on it. But I mean, because in Japan there's adult actresses who do the most like just perverted hardcore porn of getting like urinated on by hundreds of men, and then they do mainstream movies and people are like, oh, they're great, and they they'll do porn and mainstream movies like it's okay. What's the deal with... So, they don't do the, like, vaginal penetration. But that's the same thing with the... Well, they do it in porn. In porn, they do. But But in porn, don't they, like, block it out? They block out, yeah. They're not allowed to show the vagina or the penis. But they they can show the ass. What's that all about? I don't know. Uh, Because I've I've certainly seen some Japanese porn where it's not blurred out. And I don't know if that's just made for foreign markets or something, or what the deal is. You feel like if you're... In making J- it in Japan, you have to block it out. If you're distributing in Japan, you have if to it's block distri- it out. I think maybe they do, because they just put a mosaic over. So maybe they make it clean. The ones that they distribute in Japan have to be mosaic, and then the ones that go elsewhere. But it is a very weird... It's like, it's okay to take a girl... Like, there's this weird fetish of, like, schoolgirls and stuff in Japan. So oh, yeah. it's, it's okay to take a girl who is... I guess, I think the age of consent is like 18 in Japan, or at least the age where you can work in the adult industry. Yeah. So you have an 18-year-old who looks like she's like 14, you dress her up like a little girl, you get 100 guys to jack off on her face and urinate on her, but you can't show her vagina, because that would be <laughs> inappropriate yeah, and immoral. Yeah, that's odd. That's very strange. Isn't that what sort of like created that culture, though, of people jacking off on people? Well, yeah, it's this weird, it's a weird dichotomy between being very prudish on one hand and repressed but then also going to such strange extremes like there's businessmen just reading these pornographic manga on trains you know and it's nobody thinks anything of it what was that uh, movie uh, with uh, Michael Douglas and Demi Moore it was like a Michael Crichton novel adaptation remember it was like Rising Sun or something oh that was no that was with uh, (laughs) that was with Sean Connery and Wesley Snipes no 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 no, this is my, Michael... I'm pretty sure it's Michael Douglas. And he's, like... There's a prostitute or, like, killed by these Japanese businessmen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one where... Yeah, it's... Uh, they were eating sushi off of her naked body. And then they... It was, like, this autoerotic uh, strangulation thing where she gets killed by one of the Japanese businessmen yeah. while they're having sex. And then Sean Connery was, like, the... Japanese expert for some reason and he's like he's talking to Wesley Snipes and he's like come on boy now you have to listen to me and he's like oh man what the fuck and it's like I'm your senpai you have to and it's this weird like yeah he's like he, I think he even supposedly speaks Japanese and it's like crazy Scottish accent and stuff these are two different movies alright then off to an amazing start I'd say I'd just like to point out that we recorded that last segment on a highway overpass so Warren, what's on your mind? Okay, what's the deal with the used condoms? What do you mean? Why are there so many used condoms on the side of the street? Well, because people have sex in their cars. In their car when it's moving? No, I think they park. They park on the side of, like, a road, and then they have sex, and they take a condom, and they throw it out? I think I don't think it's, like, as soon as they're done, they throw the condom out of the car. I think maybe there's a little collection on the floor of the car, and then they're like, oh... And they realize that there's used condoms in there, and then they just sort of open the window. These and people throw are driving. You think these people are driving around with a bunch of used condoms, like? I, in their... Well, and I'm assuming it's it's because of prostitution. Yeah, it must be right. Because I don't know a lot of couples who go, oh, let's go park downtown and have sex in our car. Oh, it is. It probably is prostitution too, huh? Yeah. Yeah, because I see a lot of like condoms and condom wrappers around, mm-hmm. and I I've never had sex like on like a street corner. Well, I just know. never use condoms. No, yeah, that's not how I... <laughs> I walk around, I walk down the street, and I see there's no condoms. I assume you've had sex on that corner. Right. Because, yeah. Well, I, I guess it is nice that they're using protection. That's something oh, to be happy about. Yeah, you got to, you know, with these prostitutes nowadays. Are we on prostitutes again? I know. We probably should talk about prostitutes. <laughs> this is a very... For, for two people who have never had sex with a prostitute, we end up talking about them quite a bit. <laughs> oh, they're fascinating people. So, um, I just got done peeing in your bathroom. Yeah. And I noticed that your bathroom's very clean. Yeah. Yeah, it is. The floor actually, like, shines. It, like, sparkles. I mop it. Oh, you actually mop it? Yeah. 
It can't get that dirty in there, though, can it? Uh, it gets, like, like lint. I don't know if that's from, like, <laughs> rubbing myself with a towel or something once I get out. <laughs> it, but there's always, yeah, there's lint. And by the way, we're, we're recording this podcast from my apartment, my beautiful uh, penthouse? No. No, it's not on the top. No. But uh, in case you're hearing, like, homeless people gibberish or cars driving by or trains insanely loudly, that's why. It's because we're uh, from the comfort of my beautiful home. Brad lives on uh, Skid Row. Well, he lives in the area that is Skid Row, but he lives in an apartment that's in the neighborhood that is Skid the Row. The rent is cheap. But it's, it's a nice building. older building. Um, there are a lot of vagrants just stumbling about constantly. And the railroad tracks are down here, too. It's actually the best place to live because the crime is actually way less here, I think, because it's like you don't shit where you eat. The people who are going to go, you know, burglarize, burgle, yeah, they go places where, you know, there's something to burgle. Well, do you think homeless people are the people that are, like, burglarizing places? I don't, not as much. I think maybe... They're the kind of people who break into a, an elementary school and eat the crackers. Yeah, yeah, or the they summer, like sleep you know? there. Yeah. yeah, but if they if they were like, they might want to break into your car and piss in it yeah. and sleep in their own urine. I actually had in a park near here late one night. I was sauntering around for some reason, and uh, two homeless guys. There's these trails that go through the park. It's very dark and I guess easy to ambush people. And I don't know if they were sitting there planning to ambush somebody or if they just saw somebody walking by and thought, yeah, it's Anyway, they come up to me and, uh, give me your money. And I said, no. And they both kind of looked at each other like, okay, what do we do now kind of situation. And they were both so tottering drunk that I felt absolutely no threat whatsoever. I could have put out my middle finger and poked them on the forehead and they would have tumbled to the ground. So basically all that happened was they asked for my money, I said no, and then I walked away. And they sort of stood there scratching their heads in a kind of confused way. And obviously I would not get the authorities involved in a situation like that anyway, because what's the point? I mean, oh yeah, I, I, there are very few things that I would actually call the police about if I think about it. Because I, you know, I kind of subscribe to the old frontier justice sort of thing. If somebody attacks me, then I will, I will defend myself. And knowing me, you know, you know me, <laughs> I'll, I'll just beat the shit out of them, and that's it. Yeah, that's but, that. Why yeah. get the authorities involved? You're a regular killing machine. Well, you know, I, I feel like <laughs> personal justice is the best kind of justice. If someone were to kill, if I had a, a beautiful young wife who was pregnant, yeah. and I was, I don't know, maybe a cop. Yeah, and I've seen this movie. <laughs> and somebody cut her head off and put it in a box, and then I was surprised by seeing the head. I yeah. would kill the person afterwards. But maybe that's exactly what the person wanted you to do. That might be. That might have been part of their whole scheme. But it wouldn't, you know. I, I I'm not going to sit there thinking this is what he wants. Yeah, vengeance. So what what would it take for you to want to take the law into your own hands? Well, I feel like if my beautiful young pregnant wife was murdered. Mm -hmm. And then they prosecuted the guy, and then they're like, oh, he's a federal oh, Protected snitch. witness. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, we can't touch him. Which I I'd don't be think like, that really happens. No, yeah. that happens in movies. Yeah. That would be a scenario where I felt like, well, you're not going to touch him, but I'll touch him. I'll touch him with my gun. <laughs> and then I'd like go kill him, or I'd do something horrible to him. But see, and that's the problem, though, is once it's already gone through the court system and they've been let off, then you're the prime suspect then. What you need to do is they kill your beautiful pregnant young wife, yeah. and you don't even report it to the police. Well, I guess you'd have to report that she was That's dead. tricky. You're not going to report the murder of your wife <laughs> you to know. the police because you want to take care of it yourself to protect yourself from possibly being investigated for the well, murder of the person know, that killed is, your wife? This is a slippery slope, I guess. But maybe, okay. If you had if you had knowledge of the perpetrator, yeah, you could just say, "Oh, my beautiful young pregnant wife is dead," and yeah. they'd come find her and they go, "We don't know what the fuck we're doing. We, somebody killed her." And you knew, but they didn't ask you. Well, they asked you, but you lied to them. <laughs> At that point, you're protecting the person that <laughs> no, murdered you're not. your wife. You're not protecting them because then you're going to go kill them yourself. <laughs> <sighs> I'd like to let the court system have their their chance. First. I don't like. I don't want the court system. To have, I want to. I like the idea. You know, it's 1864. Oh, yeah. We're out on the frontier. The federal government hasn't taken control of everything yet. We're, sure. still, we're still governing ourselves. 
And, uh, you know, somebody rustles some of my cattle, steals a few of my horses. I'm not going to go to the sheriff, the marshal. Yeah. He's just corralling drunks that are fighting in the, you know, in the dirt roads out in front. I'm going to go myself. I'm going to get a posse together, some good friends. Like, if this, if we were living back then, I would call you. I would call a couple other good friends that we have. We'd saddle up. We'd go. We'd probably bludgeon him with, well, did they bludgeon people back then? Maybe whip them. You're going to horse whip them? Oh, that, well, they're a horse thief that you do. Yeah. Like, oh, and right? or you drag him behind the horse. Yeah. For a long time. You tie him up and then you drag him. Ah, that's what they do when they lynch people, though, too. Yeah, maybe. Well, yeah, it depends on if you tie the rope around their neck and then drag them behind a horse, or if you tie it around their feet, maybe. Yeah, I think, yeah, if you tie it around their neck, I think. That, that'd probably kill them. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you just take care of it yourself. Yeah, when I was in college, I had a roommate push a guy. Mm. Just slightly push the guy, mm-hmm. and he called the police, and they came, and they arrested my roommate. Oh, my God. And then they released him as he was standing there and then he had a court date and he was on probation or whatever yeah see uh, uh, so what did everyone else think of the the snitch the stoolie I don't think anyone the liked the guy in the first place yeah we were break dancing <laughs> what and he was the neighbor that lived below uh huh well I was I'm not a very good break dancer well, the people I, I was with were break dancing and I was trying to learn and we're you know we're slamming down we're doing all these moves <laughs> and this guy keeps banging on the ceiling right. his ceiling and so so my roommate goes down there and goes, what's the deal? And the guy's like, stop breakdancing, you know? And he's like, oh, whatever. And he kind of like just barely brushes up against him. And the mm-hmm. guy runs inside and calls the police. Well, I mean, you were breakdancing on the guy's roof. I guess I've been in situations where crime has been perpetrated upon me. Um, and once I got jumped and stabbed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've heard this story. And... uh I didn't call the police. I went to my friend's house bleeding, and then they called the police. But again, it was just the sort of thing where I had to talk for hours and hours to a couple cops. There were three different occasions where I had to go into the police station, look through their gang books that they have with just tons of mug shots. I don't know if any of these people look familiar. It was pointless. It did nothing. Of course, my frontier vengeance wouldn't work either because I had no idea who they were or where to find yeah, them. Yeah, you were looking at the books you couldn't find And them. they were gang members who probably had guns, so I probably wouldn't try to do anything. Exactly. What if this guy had come back and like kept stabbing you every couple of weeks? Um, I think I'd probably just maybe carry some sort of bludgeon. I guess me. you could wait for him. You'd be like, oh, I think my stabbing's coming. Well, if he was always stabbing me in the same area, yeah. then I could wait for him to come, and he'd be like, where's the guy I'm going to stab? And then I could jump out at him yeah. and bludgeon him instead of him stabbing me. Or I get, Yeah, if he was doing it like the same area the same time of week, he does it every yeah. week, you get stabbed there, you can avoid that area. Or you could like have a police officer come, <laughs> and you could be like, watch this. That was one of the great things about this whole, this whole situation, because you know, I'm of the opinion, if, if you don't die, eh, it's a good story later on, you know? Like yeah, I didn't, I didn't, extent, yeah. well, I didn't, I didn't have any, the injury was not that bad at all. Yeah. I mean, there was no, actually I'm kind of disappointed. There was no real jagged scarring from it because that could be something that you show the ladies. Oh, that, it's got to impress them, doesn't it? Well, I mean, yeah. Like a knife yeah, scar. Yeah, you survived the stabbing. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was no harm done, really. And then I got to, I punched him a little bit, which was cool. Yeah. And it was funny because the cops came. One of the cops was Officer Maserati. It's actually his name. <laughs> and uh, so I'm sitting there. I'm having some coffee or whatever, and my friends are all freaking out. They were more, way more worried about it than I was. And the cops were trying to get a statement from me. And so I was trying to describe. It was these three people. They just jumped me, tried to stab me. I like hit, hit a couple of them and then ran away. And uh, he took a look at my fists, and they were skinned. Like the, the skin had been oh, rubbed yeah. off my knuckles and were bleeding. And he said, did that happen in the fight? Did you fall down on your hands? It's like, no, that's from hitting a couple of them. And then he, he goes to his police radio and says, I'd like to amend the report I just put out. Uh, one of the suspects will be severely fucked up. And <laughs> oh, God. It was like he was trying to, uh, I don't know, trying to make me feel better yeah. or something like that. Because then he kind of gave me this look like, mm, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. I mean, I've got a scar. But it's from getting a mole removed from my leg when I was 12. <laughs> no one's impressed by that. No, uh, my scars would be good because one is sort of on the chest and one is on the stomach. But they're so light now that you, if I'm ever, if I ever get a lady over and we're, you know, getting undressed, getting kind of. I know exactly what you're saying. Get a little sexy. Yeah. And then I 
I always try to get somehow in the light, so maybe with a shadow or somehow the lighting will be good enough that maybe they can see the star, the scar. Sort of draw attention to it a little bit, but act like you're not. Be like, right. oh, did you, you right. happen to notice the scar? That's eh, not a story I like to tell. I don't want to get into you it. You mean these? Yeah. I mean, yeah, and then, you know, she's got to drag it out, and you're like, well, I used to fight gang members. I would fight multiple yeah. gang members, and they jumped me. And... They get severely fucked up. She talked to Officer Officer Maserati. Maserati and I had a partnership. Yeah. I was sort of on the the, the gray area of the law. Um, he 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 left things to me when when the system breaks down and it doesn't always do what it's supposed to do. You got to get you know Death Wish Bradley out there. It reminds me of Greatest American Hero, really. Yeah, that's remember not, he that's was not really he was the like, image that I wanted. No, to but he was a civilian, right? And he, he had was. the suit. But he was he had superpowers though. Well. You did fight off three gang members. I did. I did. That's superpower to me. And then there was that guy, the FBI guy, who was like, would be the officer Maserati. This is not going to make a good TV show. Because you're going to have to just get mugged every episode. Well, yeah. And then fight off the muggers. And he comes back and is like, good job. You fought off the muggers. Well, and maybe that's your show? I guess, I guess maybe I could just... I, I'm not just stupid and putting myself in dangerous situations because yeah. I'm an idiot. Maybe I'm actually seeking out these dangerous situations. Oh, he's like using you as bait. He's right. like, there's been a lot of crimes on the west side. I need hapless, you to walk. Hapless college students yeah. are getting jumped. I need you to put on a backpack and some glasses and pretend you're a college student. Yeah. Really nerd it up. And then they'll jump you, mm-hmm. and then because of your super ability to like fight back, right. you'll be able to like slightly harm them, and then I'll come take a report from you. Well, and then they'll know next time. They'll, they'll know next time not to go after these nerds. Yeah. They'll pick on like other victims. Right. <laughs> Problem solved. You know, it's it's step by step, Warren. We're not going to solve urban crime in one swoop. One no, swoop. we're going to need a couple people like you to walk around and get beat up. You know, I didn't get beaten that badly. I held my own. But see, that's I can always look back at that and say, if anyone's like, is Brad tough? Is that guy tough? There's no question. <laughs> you don't need to. comes up a lot. No, you know, because you, you don't have to ask. You don't even have to think about it. We know that I am. Well. I always assume I'm tough because I've never had to like show that I was. It's well, like that's, a, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, I always assume I can act because I've never had to act. I'm like, oh, I'd be a great actor, yeah. but you know, I'd probably be a terrible actor. Well, I think most men have that fantasy of, you know, maybe they're out on a date and these street toughs come up and yeah. you go <laughs> and start pushing them around, and then he just mops the floor with them. And you, I think everyone thinks that they could do that, and it's nice to know. I, I think more than anything in a fight, it's not your ability; it's just if you have the instinctual response or not to be able to sort of fight back without just freezing. Yeah. I think a lot of people would just freeze and just, uh, and then something happens. That's and it's a bad reaction. Yeah. So it's not like you've actually really done anything. It's just instinct took over and you were able to just let instinct take over. Yeah. I, or just run away. I'd like to know I would be able to do that and not mm. freeze. Ah, I just haven't had any uh, muggings happen or any altercations of that nature. Well, I also got shot at in L.A. as well. No. Which was... What are you going to do about that? That's well, that, that was a off. situation where, yeah, Officer Maserati put me in a place where I probably shouldn't have been. Yeah, it's like, there we've got a, a sniper on the loose. There wasn't a whole lot around. I could do there. I was just... <laughs> and this was a situation where I did just kind of freeze like an idiot because it was like the middle of the day. It was about four in the afternoon, and I used to live near Hollywood Boulevard, and I don't know if any of you out there live in the L.A. area or know anything about the geography. but <laughs> You and Radio Land. You and Radio Land, and <laughs> podcasting world. Um, but, you know, L.A.'s a shithole. I think we all know that. Yeah. And it's a weird situation where there will be little islands of okay neighborhood and then maybe two blocks away, a really shitty, dangerous neighborhood, and then another little island. And so I lived in East Hollywood, which was, I guess, little Armenia, technically, right near Thai Town. And if you walk down Hollywood Boulevard, this isn't the touristy area, that's more west. I was going towards Los Feliz, which was sort of a hipster area. But there was this maybe three-block section of Hollywood Boulevard, right near the Barnsdale Art Park, where it was not a very good area. But it was the middle of the day, walking, I think the street was about four or maybe even six lanes. So I was on one side of the street. On the other side of the street, there suddenly gunfire erupts. And me never being in a situation where somebody is shooting a gun at somebody else. I was just, oh, what's going on here? So I turn around and look, and there's two cars pulled up next to each other. 
where I, I don't know these people are the worst shot ever apparently because they're oh, yeah. both there's like two people in each car emptying guns into the other car and as far as I could tell nobody was hit and they yeah. were maybe four feet away from each other and so I'm just oh, this is like a movie and I just sat there with an idiot look on my face watching them shooting each other and then finally one of the cars like peels away and the driver of the other car pulls a U-turn, so now he sees me standing uh -oh. across the street, just staring like a gomer fool. And so he actually raises his gun up and blam, 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 like shoots, I think, three or four shots yeah. right in my direction. I don't know if he was really aiming at me or what. It was a warning, maybe. Maybe it was just a warning, but I could actually hear, you know how in movies they have the yeah, pshh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. going by your ear? I actually heard the buzzing right by my ear of a shot. And suddenly I thought, oh, this is real. And somebody is shooting a gun at me. And so I just went ah, and walked, started walking down the street. You just walked away? I just sort of walked away, like acting as though, oh, nothing going on here. I didn't see anything. Nothing to worry about. And uh, yeah, they just drove off. And then I got maybe a block away and noticed there was people on the street. Nobody seemed to think anything of the fact that there was just a huge, massive barrage of gunfire a block away. And that's when it suddenly started hitting me what had actually happened. And then my first, <laughs> my first response was to uh, go back to the scene to see if there were any shell casings on oh, the yeah. Because <laughs> I wanted to have some of the souvenirs. Like, yeah, these were the, gun the bullets that were shooting at me. And by the time I got there, the cops were there, and they asked me if I had seen anything. And apparently it was because a rival gang had tagged over somebody else's tag. Yeah. Which apparently is a very big deal. You don't no, do you that. No, you don't want to do that. No. I, you don't. I mean... Because, I mean, that's a perfectly valid reason to try to shoot somebody, oh, in my opinion. Is. I'm more concerned about the fact that your reaction to gunshots is to turn around and just, like... And watch. And watch. And then shuffle away when people shoot at you. Well, it's just to hit the ground, man. Well, but it was it was so fast, you know. Yeah. It, and it was the kind of thing where you grew up watching movies and TV shows. You're in LA, which everybody acts like they're in a movie anyway. And I think it was just hard to it, it, it didn't penetrate into my mind that this was actually happening until he actually shot a gun at me. And then I thought, and I think maybe in my sort of shocked mind, my my thinking was that if I act like nothing's wrong, and just go, okay, and turn around and walk away, then they'll be satisfied with that. If I run or act agitated, then it'll be, it's like a dog. If you show fear, they'll attack you. No, no, no. It's the exact opposite. <laughs> if, if you're shooting a gun around just wildly around and everyone else is like scattering and there's one guy standing there with his like mouth <laughs> agape, just like staring at you. That's I don't know guy. if I was. I don't know if I was a gape. I think I was just sort of huh, just looking. <laughs> but like, but I was the only one around too. So they, I already had their attention. It wasn't yeah. like I was going to draw unnecessary attention to myself. I understand about missing people too with the guns because every time I've shot a handgun, I can't hit anything with it. I'm actually I not really? bad with the handgun, yeah. But if you were like in a car, and yeah, I kinda... don't know. I mean, if it were actually a situation where it's I had to... hard to shoot things with guns. Yeah. It's one thing to shoot a can of cream corn from yeah. <laughs> from 50 feet away. It's one thing to shoot a can of cream corn. It's another thing to shoot a man. Yeah, you it's, know, it's a hell of a thing shooting a man. Oh God. Cream corn, <laughs> different. Okay, here's a question for you. Oh, fantastic. If you did have to defend yourself yeah. with, with lethal force, you were in a situation, you know, somebody pulls a gun on you, you're struggling for the gun, there's a mm -hmm. fight, elbows flying and everything. Oh, yeah. You manage to, to get the gun away, but while you're struggling for the gun, it goes off and the man is shot, he's dead. Mm hmm would you feel any guilt? Something I was actually thinking about this this week because... About struggling with someone with a gun? Yeah. Um, one of my coworkers was fired, uh -huh. and he I don't does know. he own guns? Is he going to come back he with a gun? Has, he has that look about him where you wonder. And people is this actually, the guy that you were telling me about before who showed you his gun? No, oh boy. People, yeah, if, I, if <laughs> anyone ever is listening to this show in another country, we have guns. There are guns um, in America. We have um, lots of guns. No, he still works. Um, this other guy, I don't know. He just was kind of a surly guy, and so. He got fired, and then people kept mentioning to me, oh, he's not going to go postal, is he? And I'm like, I don't think so. But the same thing was occurring to me in my mind. All right, well, describe this guy to me. How old is he? Yeah, he's got 50s. 50s, okay. Is he quiet? Does he keep to himself? Yeah, kind of quiet. Kind of looks like a, an accountant. Sort of overweight, balding. Mild overweight, matter. short, Yeah. balding, big glasses. Big glasses, yeah. Like a weird beard. 
thing. No, what kind of beard? Describe the beard. Like a kind of a goatee thing. Mm. No, like sense of humor. Mm. And for some reason, I went to lunch the other day after he was fired, and I I was like walking back, and I was thinking, I wonder if he's in there, and he's got a gun. Does he ever have any weird theories about the Jews or the Zionists? I never got into or... it with him. He was never somebody I wanted to talk to for very long. Okay. He was the person that wasn't allowed inside because he didn't have the proper license. So he was actually never actually came inside. It's a it's a long story. It's okay. ridiculous. Yeah, but... for, we don't want to... For people listening to this, we don't really need to tell you anything about ourselves. So we're not going <laughs> to actually explain anything that we're talking about. Okay, but this is... I'm coming if back. You, if you get it, it's fine. If you don't, it's fine. I'm coming back from lunch. Uh-huh. I'm thinking about this guy that just got fired. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking in my mind, he goes in with a gun. He's holding everybody hostage. Right. And what would you do? I'm imagining myself coming up. They've got, like, the cops out there. The one guy has, like, the... the, He's talking into the horn, whatever Mm -hmm. that... What's that called? The the megaphone. Megaphone. He's, you know, come on, yeah, let him go, you know. There's no reason we need to do this. This isn't good for anybody. And I walk up. I'm like, hey, what's going on? I got my pistachios. They're like, this guy's holding everyone hostage in there. I'm like, is it this guy? And they're like, oh, it's him. Is Officer Maserati there? Officer he'd Maserati is there. Me of- yeah, he's like, I, he's like, what are you going to do about it? I'm like, what am I going to do about it? No, I say, and they go, you know what he says? The guy inside, he says, I'm only going to talk to Warren. No, he says, I'll let everyone else inside go if Warren will go in. <laughs> and they're like, we understand. We can't ask you to do this. <laughs> because, you know, it's a big sacrifice by you. Yeah. And I was just picturing myself going, what would you do? Oh, yeah. I was like, no problem. No problem. Let's do it. And they're like, wow, this guy is so brave. <laughs> so do you, do you end up dying? Well, then I thought about it. And they, we swapped out. They swapped everybody. I go in there. At some point, I was thinking about how I would like look like to the side. Right. When he was like facing me. And he'd be like, what? Like, what's going on what's back there? What's that behind you? What's that behind you? And he would have, like, a rifle, and I would grab it. And see, I, like, see, that's something that nobody ever tries, but it works every time. Oh, it's a great, it's a great fake. And I take it, and I get the rifle from him, and I, like, hit him in the face with the butt of the rifle, knock him out. Does he, I, have a, he has an assault rifle? Well, I was picturing it like a hunting rifle in my mind. Yeah, probably. I feel like he's the guy that might have a hunting rifle, but wouldn't have, like, an AK-47. Right. And I drag him out, and I got the gun. I'm like, I take care of the situation. And you don't like, see, wow. if I did that, I would, I would shoot him in the leg, just for the hell of it. Because really? you could say that that happened in the struggle, maybe. Because why not? You know? I don't know. I don't want to shoot anybody maybe in the leg sh- unless I have to. Or a kneecap or something. Well, if he had, like, raped and killed my pregnant wife, yeah, yeah. then well, I would do that. that goes without saying. Next time on The Ward and Bradley Show. I hate your face. I hate it. Like, oh, you drunk Warren, come on, stop it. I want to bludgeon a woman to death with my erect penis. Yes. The Warren and Bradley Show. Available on iTunes and at warrenandbradley.com. <laughs>